Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother, Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right. We love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for December 4th through 10th, 2023. This is covering Revelation chapters 1 through 5. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, Scriptures! Oh, so great to see you. So many things we want to learn from you today. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 20 minutes, 49 seconds. That's no problem. And what would it be daily? 2 minutes, 58 seconds. So easy to do and such valuable reading. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter, and we recommend that you spend some time and really sink your teeth into these incredible chapters. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. And with that, we'd like to start by talking about a few resources that might help your study. First of all, the December 2019 Enzyme has a great article called The Book of Revelation, a Testament to the Lamb of God by Nicholas J. Frederick, Assistant Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. Also in the December 2019 Enzyme, there's an article called Messages of the Book of Revelation for Latter-day Saints by Richard D. Draper, Emeritus Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU. And finally, remember that there is a new rendition of the Book of Revelation provided by BYU. This was done by Michael D. Rhodes and Richard D. Draper. You can read it for free online. We'll include links to all three of these in the description. Excellent. Let's get into the book of Revelation. We'll take our introduction from the 2016 Seminary Manual, which says this. The Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus Christ, is the author of this book. The Book of Mormon affirms that John was foreordained to write the things recorded in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written at a time when Christians were facing false teachings, apathy, and severe persecution. This persecution most likely came at the hands of Roman officials in the final two decades of the first century AD. John wrote from the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, about 60 miles southwest of Ephesus. John wrote a message of hope and encouragement to the saints in his day, and those in the latter days. The first three chapters of Revelation were specifically addressed to seven branches of the church in Asia Minor. Because of intense persecution, the saints were in great need of the encouraging message found in Revelation. In addition, the prophet Nephi testified that God hath ordained the apostle John to write about the end of the world, and that his words would come forth to both the Gentiles and the remnant of Israel in the latter days. As the revelation of Jesus Christ, this book is sometimes called the Apocalypse, which in Greek means a revelation, uncovering, or unveiling of that which is hidden. This book is an unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ and a revelation of his authority, power, and preeminent role in the Father's plan of salvation. The book also reveals much important information about the events leading up to the second coming and the millennium. Now, although this book is frequently difficult to understand by many, in the April 1843 General Conference, the Prophet Joseph Smith declared, quote, The book of Revelation is one of the plainest books God ever caused to be written, end quote. And by the way, I found that quote in a December 2015 Enzyme article called Joseph Smith and the Book of Revelation. That might also help your study. We'll put a link to that in the description. Fantastic. Now, you might find as we study together that some of the things that were very confusing to you, if you've read this before, might become more clear by using some of the resources that we will to help make sense of it, including the Joseph Smith translation. And speaking of that, let's begin in Revelation chapter 1 by reading the Joseph Smith translation of the first three verses. Starting in verse 1. The revelation of John, a servant of God, which was given unto him of Jesus Christ, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, that he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. 
Blessed are they who read, and they who hear and understand the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time of the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I appreciate the importance to hear and understand the words in order to be blessed by them, plus the injunction to obey what is written. I also think it's interesting that John mentioned both those who hear his words and those who read his words, like it says in verse 2. In John's day, many saints could not read, so they became acquainted with the book of Revelation by listening to others read it aloud. Now, verse 3 includes a great phrase, blessed are they. The Institute Manual says the book of Revelation contains several blessed is statements. These are similar to the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 11. The progression of actions described in Revelation 1 verse 3, read, hear, and keep, shows that besides reading or hearing the book of Revelation, or any other book of Scripture, we must also keep those things which are written therein. By doing all of these things, we receive the promised blessings. The Joseph Smith translation of verse 3 adds the word understand to this sequence, showing the importance of understanding the teachings of this book. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 includes the phrase, for the time is at hand. The Joseph Smith translation of verse 3 clarifies this concept, for the time of the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. When John said that he was shown things which must shortly come to pass, The second coming was one of the things he referred to. As with all things, the second coming will occur in accordance with the Lord's timetable. And that's an important clarification, because certainly this was written over 1900 years ago. Right. Let's go on with verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. From here on, through chapter 3, John will be addressing each of the seven churches in Asia. The seven churches which are in Asia refers to seven church congregations, like wards or branches today, that were located in what is now the western area of modern-day Turkey. The seven spirits refers to the leaders of those congregations. Like the imagery of the seven spirits, John will be using other symbolic imagery through the rest of the chapter. The Institute Manual says, Symbols are powerful teaching tools because they can communicate to people in different generations and cultures. They can communicate multiple messages. God often uses symbols to teach eternal truths, including truths about His beloved Son. To understand symbols, the following guidelines may be helpful. 1. Study the scriptures to determine if other passages provide an interpretation or insight. 2. Examine the context in which the symbols are used. 3. Consider the nature and characteristics of the symbols. 4. Use the study aids in the scriptures. And 5. Most important, seek personal revelation from God. The Institute Manual then includes a chart with possible interpretations of several of the symbols. We'll include this in our slides, but for our audio listeners, we encourage you to look at this chart in the Institute Student Manual, located in your Gospel Library. Let's go on with verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the Prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. The seminary manual includes this great quote from President Joseph F. Smith. This is from the book Teachings of Presidents of the Church, Joseph F. Smith. He says, quote, The object of our earthly existence is that we may have a fullness of joy, and that we may become the sons and daughters of God in the fullest sense of the word, being heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. To be kings and priests unto God, who inherit glory, dominion, exaltation, thrones, and every power and attribute developed and possessed by our Heavenly Father. This is the object of our being on this earth. 
in order to attain unto this exalted position, it is necessary that we go through this mortal experience or probation, by which we may prove ourselves worthy through the aid of our elder brother, Jesus. Close quote. The manual also includes this other quote from President Joseph Fielding Smith. This is from his book, Answers to Gospel Questions. It says, quote, The faithful have been promised that they shall become sons and daughters of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And if they have been true to the commandments and covenants the Lord has given us, to be kings and priests and queens and priestesses, possessing the fullness of the blessings of the celestial kingdom. Close quote. Let's go on with verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so. Amen. The Institute Manual tells us that the message of Joseph Smith translation, Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, conveys comfort and hope. These verses describe the Savior's second coming. Therefore, I, John, the faithful witness, bear record of the things which were delivered me of the angel, and from Jesus Christ, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. For behold, he cometh in the clouds with ten thousands of his saints in the kingdom, clothed with the glory of his Father. And every eye shall see him, and they who pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This is in the Bible appendix. These teachings help us understand that the many faithful saints who died at the hands of persecutors did not die in vain and will be rewarded for their righteousness. Going on with verse 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Did you notice what John wanted the congregations to know about Jesus Christ? He is the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father like it says in verses 5 and 6, and that he will come again in glory, like it says in verse 7. And he is eternal and almighty, as it says in verse 8. What great teachings that each of us should know, especially in times of trial. The Institute Manual adds, the title Almighty is the English translation of the Greek word pantokrater, which suggests one who rules and regulates all things. One theme of the book of Revelation is that even though God's people in all ages face persecution and trouble, God does indeed govern all things and will one day put an end to all evil. Several images from the first chapters of Revelation reinforce the Savior's role as the Almighty, His word is represented as a sharp two-edged sword. He holds the keys of hell and of death, and he knows people's works. The Institute Manual also includes this quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. He says, quote, Nothing is so pervasive in our lives, nothing so encompassing and enfolding and upholding as the Savior of this world and the Redeemer of all men. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, suggests commencement and inception. I was in the beginning with the Father, he reveals. And as the firstborn, he stood at the right hand of the Father in the councils of heaven and in the work of creation. It was by our unity with him, as he was one with the Father, that we survived a great conflict between good and evil before this world was created. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, we overcame the opposition of Satan, that old serpent called the devil. As he was in the beginning, so will he be when this world ends. As Omega, a name taken from the last letter of the Greek alphabet, Christ is the terminus, the end cause, as well as the end result of mortal experience. 
These letters from the Greek suggest the universal role of Jesus from the beginning of the world to its end. But he ought to be Alpha and Omega in the particular as well, our personal beginning and our individual end. Close quote. This is from an article called Whom Say Ye That I Am in the September 1974 Enzyme. That's awesome. And while we're talking about Alpha and Omega, take a look at this image in the Institute Manual. This is an image from the Catacomb of Comodilla in Rome. This was a painting created in the 4th century AD. You can see a portrait of Christ and the Greek letters Alpha and Omega on either side of him. I love these. It's pretty cool. That's excellent. So this vision in the book of Revelation, how did it happen? Let's keep going in verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Theatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Now, here we have a map of the locations of the seven churches and where John was writing from, the island of Patmos, as he mentions in verse 9. The 2016 Seminary Manual tells us, John received this revelation during a difficult time for members of the church. During this time, there was intense persecution toward the saints and apostasy and division among church members. Additionally, all the apostles, except John, had been killed. The book of Revelation may have been written during the time of the Roman emperor Domitian, who had reinstituted emperor worship throughout the Roman Empire and exiled or executed those who did not worship gods approved by the Roman government. Many people believe John was exiled to the island of Patmos for that reason. And notice in verse 11, John was told, What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. We learn from the Book of Mormon that Nephi had a vision similar to John's vision. Nephi saw the events of the last days, including Jesus Christ's second coming, the millennium, and the completion of God's work on the earth. But he was commanded not to write about them because John had been foreordained to do so. Now, in the coming verses, the Lord will use various symbols to teach with. This should not be too unfamiliar to us as we've studied many symbols and allegories just this year. Think of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. Disciples of Jesus are to be a light on a hill to shine forth to others, like it says in verses 14 to 16. We are also supposed to be like salt to the world, verse 13. And we talked about what that might be symbolic of. Paul used the exciting symbols of armor in Ephesians 6 to represent the spiritual traits of righteousness, faith, and salvation. Also, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, when the Lord uses symbols in the coming verses and chapters, it shouldn't be too confusing, especially with Scripture study aids to help us. So, let's jump in, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned... I saw seven golden candlesticks. Ah, lights being held up. See, not too bad. Let's explore this image. What do you think the seven golden candlesticks could represent? Well, John was supposed to deliver this message to the seven churches of Asia, so that could have something to do with it. Those candles could be those churches lifted up to give light to the world around them. Oh, that's a great insight. Well, thanks, but I skipped ahead a little and got it from the definition found in verse 20. (laughs) Ha ha ha! That's a good strategy. Sometimes, not too often, the Lord will define his own spiritual imagery. So keep looking to your scriptures. The Institute Manual confirms, the imagery of the seven golden candlesticks recalls the seven-branched menorah found in the Jerusalem temple. These candlesticks represented the seven churches. 
Now remember that the Savior had commanded his disciples to give his light to the world. One example is found in 3 Nephi chapter 18, verse 24, which says, Therefore, hold up your light, that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, this is very similar to the description that Joseph Smith gave of the resurrected Jesus Christ in Doctrine and Covenants section 110, verse 3. This is when Joseph and Oliver saw the Savior in the Kirtland Temple on April 3, 1836. The Institute Manual says, In John's vision, he saw Jesus Christ in the midst of the seven candlesticks, showing symbolically that he was with or among the seven ancient churches. During his mortal ministry, Jesus promised, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The assurance that Jesus Christ is with his saints and watches over them is also found in modern scripture, such as in Doctrine and Covenants section 38, verse 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that mine eyes are upon you. I am in your midst, and ye cannot see me. Such assurances have also been reiterated by modern prophets and apostles. President Henry B. Eyring of the First Presidency testified that the Lord, quote, watches with us. He who sees all things, whose love is endless, and who never sleeps, he watches with us, close quote. That's from the April 2001 General Conference. Going back to chapter 1, verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Oh, there's a lot of great stuff in that verse. Let's take it from the top. What is the significance of the right hand? After the resurrection of Jesus, he ascended into heaven and, as Mark tells us in chapter 16, sat on the right hand of God. The right hand is seen as a place of honor and status throughout the biblical text. The seven stars are also defined in verse 20 as angels of the seven churches. The Joseph Smith translation clarifies that they were the servants of the seven churches. The Institute Manual adds, Thus the seven stars represent the presiding officers who were then leading the seven churches. Great! And notice that those servants were in the right hand of the Lord, a place of honor. Now, out of the mouth of the Lord was a sharp two-edged sword. Literally, that would be very strange. But symbolically, it would be a very powerful image. Do you remember what the sword represents? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 gives us some insight. For the word of God is quick or alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And check out this verse from the Book of Mormon, Helaman chapter 3, verse 29. Yea, we see that the word of God is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and the snares and the wiles of the devil. So, are you getting an idea of what this two-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of the Lord is like? It can divide asunder the soul and spirit. It can be a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It can be something that divides asunder all the cunning snares and wiles of the devil. That's what the Word of God is. So, how are you feeling about the imagery so far? Not too bad, huh? Yeah, pretty good. Let's go on with verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. 
and have the keys of hell and of death. Now, these verses might help add richness to what we just read. Let's take a look at 2 Nephi chapter 9, starting in the midst of verse 12. Wherefore, death and hell must deliver up their dead, and hell must deliver up its captive spirits, and the grave must deliver up its captive bodies, and the bodies of the spirits of men will be restored one to the other. And it is by the power of the resurrection of the Holy One of Israel. Oh, how great the plan of our God! For on the other hand, the paradise of God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous, and the grave deliver up the body of the righteous, and the spirit and the body be restored to itself again, and all men become incorruptible and immortal, and they are living souls having a perfect knowledge. So to summarize, the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches that are to hold up the light of the gospel, and the right hand represents divine power and approval, which is directed at the seven stars, which symbolize the servants or leaders over the seven churches who are upheld by the Lord. The sword represents the word of God, pronouncing judgment on the wicked and freeing the innocent. And the keys of hell and death represent the Lord's power to overcome spiritual and physical death. That is a very hopeful message. Let's not lose track of that as we continue our studies. The Bible Dictionary entry for Revelation of John tells us, quote, The message of Revelation is the same as that of all Scripture. There will be an eventual triumph on this earth of God over the devil, a permanent victory of good over evil, of the saints over their persecutors, of the kingdom of God over the kingdoms of men and of Satan, end quote. So, let's keep going in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, this is a good guide. Going forward in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, John wrote about the things which are, or the condition of the church in his day. Revelation 4 through 22 records what John wrote about the things which shall be hereafter, or the future. Great. So, that brings us to Revelation chapter 2. Now, chapters 2 and 3 contain the Apostle John's record of Jesus Christ's word to the seven church congregations in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. I've always liked how the Institute Manual organized the information from these verses. Let's look at each of the churches using the information found there. We'll see a column for church, a column for description of Jesus Christ, a column for praise and commendation to that church, and another column for correction and counsel, and then promise to those who overcome. Let's start with the message to the church at Ephesus. The Institute Manual tells us the Nicolaitans were an antinomian sect. Wait, wait a minute. You just said Nicolaitans and antinomian. I did. As if those were just common words <laughs> that we would just throw out there. Those are really, those are something, those words. Well, the Institute Manual will help us understand them, so stay with me. The Nicolaitans were an antinomian sect in Asia Minor that claimed license for sensual sin. Antinomians were permissive Christians who claimed that the grace of God freed them from having to obey commandments. The Lord commended some saints for rejecting the deeds of the Nicolaitans while chastising other saints for holding to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, good. Thank you for that. Very helpful. Now let's take a look at the Lord's counsel to the church in Smyrna. The Institute Manual says, the Lord told the saints in Smyrna that some of them would be imprisoned and would have temptations and trials, but they should not fear. If they were faithful unto death, he would give them a crown of life, like it says in chapter 2, verse 10. A fulfillment of the Lord's words can be seen in the life of Polycarp, a bishop of the church in Smyrna who lived from A.D. 69 to 155. Polycarp was a disciple of John and one of the last surviving church leaders who had personally heard the teachings of an apostle and eyewitness of Jesus Christ. Because he would not renounce his faith, he was burned at the stake as a martyr. When he was told that he could avoid martyrdom by worshiping the Roman emperor and cursing Christ, Polycarp replied, For eighty and six years have I been Christ's servant, 
and he has done me no wrong. And how can I blaspheme my king that saved me? Later, Christians remembered Polycarp for the courage and faith he showed in the face of great adversity. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, verse 11 talks about the second death. It refers to a spiritual death or a separation from God's presence. And that brings us to the message of the church at Pergamos. Let's summarize the information in the Institute Manual. John recorded that Satan's seat was in Pergamos and commended the saints in Pergamos for not denying the faith, even though much wickedness surrounded them. Elder Bruce R. McConkie defined Satan's seat as the center of imperial worship, meaning the worship of the emperor of Rome, which was centralized in Pergamos. And in verse 13, there's a phrase, Thou holdest fast to my name. The Institute Manual says, Christians who were sentenced by Roman officials to prison or death could sometimes save themselves by cursing Christ and worshiping the emperor instead. John recorded the Lord's praise of the saints in Pergamos for holding fast his name, even under the threat of death. A recurring phrase in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is the admonition to hold fast to the truth. And notice the mention of Balaam in verse 14. The Institute Manual tells us, Balaam was an Old Testament prophet whose actions are recorded in Numbers chapters 22 through 24 and 31 verse 16. He appeared at first to be true to the Lord and his people, repeatedly refusing Balak's request to curse Israel. Nevertheless, Balaam eventually succumbed to Balak's offer of riches and taught Balak how to cause the army of Israel to weaken themselves through sexual sin and idolatry. The plan included having Moabite women seduce the men of Israel and persuade them to offer sacrifices to heathen gods, thus destroying them spiritually. There's an interesting phrase you might have noticed in verse 17, the hidden manna that the righteous would be given, or a white stone with a new name. The Institute Manual says, The Lord provided life-sustaining manna for the children of Israel to eat during their 40-year sojourn in the wilderness. Just as the manna sustained physical life, Jesus Christ is the bread of life that sustains spiritual life. The hidden manna, mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, refers to Jesus Christ. Jesus is hidden from the wicked. But as he taught in John 6, those who symbolically partake of his flesh will receive everlasting life. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 states this instruction to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name. For revealed insight into the meaning of the white stone, let's take a look at Doctrine and Covenants section 130. When the earth becomes sanctified, it will become a Urim and Thummim to the celestial inhabitants who dwell there. Let's take a look at verse 10. Then the white stone mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 will become a Urim and Thummim to each individual who receives one whereby things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms will be made known. And a white stone is given to each of those who come into the celestial kingdom, whereon is a new name written, which no man knoweth, save he that receiveth it. The new name is the key word. And that's all we know about it for now. Nice. Let's take a look at the Lord's counsel to the church and Theatira. Now, verse 23 gives an interesting phrase. It uses the terms reigns and hearts. The Institute Manual says the word reigns literally means kidneys. To the Hebrews, the word signified strength and vigor. In Greek, the word implies desires and thoughts. The phrase searcheth the reins and hearts is an idiom, meaning that the Lord knows all things about the inner man. It is because of this perfect understanding that the Lord is able to give unto every one of you according to your works. And in verse 28, it says, I will give him the morning star. The Institute Manual tells us that the morning star is a symbol of Jesus Christ. The promise of the morning star is given to him that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Let's go on to the Lord's counsel for the church at Philadelphia. In verse 7, 
there is mention of the key of David. The Institute Manual tells us Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 contains a quotation from the prophet Isaiah, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. That's Isaiah chapter 22 verse 22. Isaiah was speaking about one of King David's chief ministers, Eliakim, who was given the keys to open locked doors of the holy temple. These keys can be seen as a symbol of power and governing authority. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, Jesus referred to himself as the one who holds the key of David, meaning that he holds the key to the heavenly temple and ultimately to life in the presence of God. Nice. The Institute Manual also shares this insight. It says, The Lord declared that he will write the name of my God upon those who overcome. Referencing Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. A name could suggest many ideas about a person, including the person's identity, reputation, family, associations, attributes, role, and abilities. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote about one of the meanings of this statement. Quote, God's name is God. To have his name written on a person is to identify that person as a God. Those who gain eternal life become gods. Close quote. This is from his doctrinal New Testament commentary. We'll learn more about what it means to have the name of God written on us as we study Revelation chapter 14 and 22. And now let's take a look at the Lord's counsel to the church at Laodicea. Notice that in verse 14, there's a reference to the Amen. The Institute Manual tells us, In Hebrew and Greek, the word Amen means truly, certainly, or faithfully. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, Christ's faithfulness and truthfulness as the great Amen are represented as a contrast to the lukewarm attitudes of the Laodiceans. Notice, too, that the people in Laodicea do not have anything on the chart under compliments or commendations. And that could be because they're described as lukewarm. Verses 15 and 16 emphasize the importance of not being lukewarm. Now, the English Standard Version Study Bible has a nice insight. It says, The waters of the nearby Lycus River were muddy and undrinkable and the waters flowing by aqueduct from the hot springs five miles away in Hierapolis were lukewarm when they reached Laodicea. Likewise, Jesus found his church's tepid indifference repugnant. Cold and hot water represent something positive, for cold water refreshes in the heat, and hot water is a tonic when one is chilly. I'm very grateful for an insight I learned from Brandon J. O'Brien, co-author of the great book, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. He expands this concept. He points out that not only does Hierapolis, which is in view of Laodicea, have famous mineral-rich hot springs, but at about the same distance and in the opposite direction is Colossae. It was a much less notable city than Laodicea, but it had one thing Laodicea didn't a cold, freshwater spring. Laodicea had no water source at all. It had to import its water via aqueduct from elsewhere, hot mineral water from Hierapolis, or fresh cold water from Colossae. The trouble was, by the time the water from either city made it to Laodicea, it had lost the qualities that made it remarkable. Similarly, the disciples in Laodicea were unremarkable. They were lukewarm, and had no special qualities. The Savior taught the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4, verse 14, The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's awesome. The Institute Manual includes this great quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This is from the April 2003 General Conference. He says, quote, The book of Revelation declares, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Each of us has to face the matter. Either the church is true, or it is a fraud. There is no middle ground. It is the church and kingdom of God, or it is nothing. End quote. 
But the Laodiceans also received this teaching, which is one of my favorite verses on repentance. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So because the Lord loves us, He corrects us, so we will repent, so we will change and become more like God. And take a look at the next verse, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So why do you think the Savior knocks on the door instead of just entering? What do we learn about the importance of using our agency to accept Christ? Perhaps it would be useful to ask in what ways we can do better at opening the door to Jesus Christ and seek to better hear his voice. The Institute Manual includes this great quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This is from the October 2007 General Conference. He says, quote, With all the strength of my soul, I testify that our Heavenly Father loves each one of us. He hears the prayers of the humble hearts. He hears our cries for help. His Son, our Savior and Redeemer, speaks to each of us today. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. Will we listen for that knock? Will we hear that voice? Will we open that door to the Lord that we may receive the help he is so ready to provide? I pray that we will. End quote. So, if we were to summarize these instructions and promises to the seven churches in Asia, we might say that we learn that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ know each of us. They can acknowledge our good works and warn us of needed changes, and that God's desire in offering that change is motivated by love and an invitation to be more like Him. As we examine the messages to the seven churches, we can see a pattern of promises to those who overcome or are victorious in their discipleship. Look at the chart and notice that we will see the fulfillments of these promises in the book of Revelation itself. So in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7, the righteous are promised that they will eat from the tree of life. The fulfillment of that is found in chapter 22 verse 2. In chapter 2, verse 11, the righteous are promised that they will not be hurt by the second death. The fulfillment is in chapter 20, verse 6, and chapter 21, verses 7 and 8. And in chapter 2, verse 17, the righteous will be given a white stone. The fulfillment of that in the vision is in chapter 21, verse 11, and verses 18 through 21. Chapter 2, verses 26 through 27, and chapter 3, verse 21, promise the righteous will reign with Christ on his throne. That's fulfilled in chapter 20, verse 4. And in chapter 2, verse 28, the righteous will be given the morning star. And that's fulfilled in chapter 21, verses 23, and chapter 22, verses 5 and 16. Chapter 3, verse 5, the righteous are promised they will be clothed in white garments. The fulfillment in the vision is in chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, chapter 21, verse 2, and verses 9 through 10. And also in verse 5, the righteous are promised that their name will be in the book of life. That's fulfilled in chapter 21, verse 27. Chapter 3, verse 12, the righteous are promised they will be made a pillar in God's temple. That's fulfilled in chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. Also in verse 12, the righteous will participate in the new Jerusalem, fulfilled in chapter 21, verse 10. And finally in verse 12, the righteous will have God's name written upon them, and that's fulfilled in chapter 22, verse 4. There will be a great fulfillment of promises by the end of the vision. Very exciting. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 4. Let's start in verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The Institute Manual quotes Gerald N. Lund from an article in the December 1987 Enzyme called Seeing the Book of Revelation as a Book of Revelation. He says, quote, The basic structure of the vision is chronological. 
after seeing the Father and the Son in heaven, chapters 4 and 5, the vision of the history and destiny of the world begin to unfold for John. He sees the first five seals, or first 5,000 years of history, in rapid fire, in encapsulated form. Then he sees the opening of the sixth seal, which includes the restoration of the gospel. After that, John sees the seventh period of a thousand years, with great judgments poured out upon the earth, including Armageddon, which eventually lead to the utter overthrow of Babylon and make way for the second coming of him who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Immediately following that, John sees Satan bound and Christ reigning for a thousand years, a last great battle between the forces of righteousness and evil and the final judgment. Finally, a new heaven and a new earth are brought forth. Close quote. That's a great summary. Indeed. Let's go on with Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, meaning to be enveloped by the Spirit in a revelatory state or vision. Going on. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Okay. (laughs) So what the heck are we looking at? Does it seem confusing to you like it does to us? Well, that's okay. It was even confusing to Joseph Smith. He asked the Lord about some of this imagery, and the Lord revealed his answers in Doctrine and Covenants section 77. We talked about it in more detail in our Scripture Gems episode for that section, but let's summarize some of the insights we get from it. The 24 elders were elders who had been faithful in the work of the ministry and were dead, who belonged to the seven churches and were then in the paradise of God. That's from Doctrine and Covenants 77, verse 5. Excitingly, this vision confirms the promises made to those who overcome evil, as recorded in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. The seven lamps are the seven servants of God, as we learned in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The sea of glass, mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, represents the earth in its sanctified, immortal, and eternal state. We learned about that in Doctrine and Covenants 77, verse 1, and also in Doctrine and Covenants section 130. The wings of the beasts are a representation of power to move, to act, etc. And the eyes of the beasts are a representation of light and knowledge. We learned this from Doctrine and Covenants 77, verse 4. The Institute Manual says, In John's vision of the heavenly throne, he saw four beasts praising God, These four-winged creatures, described in Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, are similar to the heavenly beings described in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. Latter-day Revelation explains the meaning of these beasts, as recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 77, verses 2 through 4. In addition, the prophet Joseph Smith taught, Quote, the four beasts were four of the most noble animals that had filled the measure of their creation and had been saved from other worlds because they were perfect. They were like angels in their sphere. We are not told where they came from, close quote. That's from the History of the Church, Volume 5. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 4 and we'll repeat verse 8 now with that knowledge. 
And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth for ever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth for ever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Can you envision that event? What could the elders casting their crowns before Heavenly Father's throne represent? Perhaps it is their recognition of Heavenly Father's greatness, their acknowledgement that they owe their exaltation to Him, and their reverence, adoration, and submissive devotion to Him. How important it is that we recognize Heavenly Father's greatness. It is then that we desire to worship and praise Him, and strive to be like Him. And that brings us to Revelation chapter 5. Let's start in verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of Him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. The Institute Manual says, Doctrine and Covenant 77 verses 6 and 7 contains an explanation of the book with seven seals. Quote, the first seal contains the things of the first thousand years, and the second also of the second thousand years, and so on until the seventh. Close quote. If you're interested, the Institute Manual has a chart that takes readers through the seven seals and the book of Revelation in general. It can really help you to get your bearings as you study. We'll link to the PDF in the description. Also, the 2016 Seminary Manual tells us the 7,000-year period refers to the time since the fall of Adam and Eve. It does not refer to the actual age of the earth, including the periods of creation. So, since the book with seals represents the earth's temporal history, John may have worried that if no man were worthy to open it, then God's purpose in creating the earth would not come to pass. What would happen to Heavenly Father's children if His plan for their salvation could not be carried out? Aha, but fear not. Let's continue. In verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, both of these are titles of Jesus Christ, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The Joseph Smith translation changes seven to twelve, so twelve spirits of God are sent forth. Verse 7, And he, this is Jesus, came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. The Institute Manual says, John described the lamb in his vision as having many horns and eyes. In the scriptures, horns are often a symbol of power. Eyes often symbolize light and knowledge. The Joseph Smith translation for Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 indicates that the lamb had 12 horns and 12 eyes, which are the 12 servants of God. Since the Lord's people in ancient Israel were numbered as twelve tribes, and the Lord organized his church with twelve apostles, the number twelve can symbolize divine government and organization, or the priesthood. This verse may suggest that all priesthood power and knowledge is centered in the Lamb of God. But look at how the hosts of heaven responded to this. Verse 8, And when he had taken the book, The four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. He's referring to wide cups or bowls full of incense. Going on, verse 9. 
And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is such a beautiful image. The Institute Manual says Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 declares that through the worthiness and redeeming blood of Jesus Christ, all people may be redeemed and crowned with glory to reign on the glorified earth as kings and priests. After quoting these verses, Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that temple ordinances anticipate the fulfillment of these blessings. Quote, Before the time when Christ shall reign personally upon the earth, the elect of God among every kindred, having first believed the restored gospel, will go to the temples of God and receive the ordinances of exaltation, whereby they qualify to become kings and priests. This is from a conference talk in the April 1969 General Conference. But who else joined in praising God the Father and His Son? Verse 11. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Wow! After the Lamb took the book from the hand of Heavenly Father, the heavenly beings recognized the goodness of God the Father and Jesus Christ and felt gratitude for the Lamb's role in Heavenly Father's plan. It's powerful that they worshipped God. God is not like an earthly leader who requires followers in order to be a leader. Followers allow a leader to lead. God is to be worshipped. In the seminary manual, it includes a quote from Elder Dean M. Davies. This is from the October 2016 General Conference. He talks about worship. He says, quote, When we worship God, we approach Him with reverent love, humility, and adoration. We acknowledge and accept Him as our sovereign King, the Creator of the universe, our beloved and infinitely loving Father. We respect Him and revere Him. We submit ourselves to Him. We lift our hearts in mighty prayer, cherish His word, rejoice in His grace, and commit to follow Him with dedicated loyalty. When we worship, our hearts are drawn out in praise to our blessed God, morning, noon, and night. We hallow and honor Him continually in our meeting houses, homes, temples, and all our labors. When we worship, we open our hearts to the healing power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Our lives become the token and expression of our worship. Close quote. And for those of you who might have been wondering whether or not I'd bring up Handel's Messiah again, wonder not. The closing movement of Handel's Messiah, Worthy is the Lamb, is a powerful representation of the praise of the angels. Plus, It has a surprisingly long amen, just under four minutes, but with a glorious finale. If you'd like to listen to it, we'll include a link in the description. Fantastic. And those are the first five chapters of the Apocalypse or Revelation of John. Wow, that's amazing stuff. I hope that you felt a little bit more confident as we thought about the kinds of imagery that's there. Our default might be to think of things very literally, but you could see the power that comes in the symbolic use of those images. But there's still lots more to talk about in the book of Revelation, so keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.